Welcome, and thank you for standing by. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. All participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, you may press star 1 on your phone to ask a question. I would now like to turn the conference over to John Berklow. You may begin. Thanks very much, Skylar, and good morning, everyone. And welcome to the media telebriefing to celebrate the announcement that Dr. Harvey Alter has won the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his contributions to the discovery of the hepatitis C virus. As Schuyler said, I'm John Berkeley, Associate Director for Communications and Public Liaison at NIH, and I'm joined by Dr. Francis Collins, NIH Director, Dr. James Gilman, CEO of the NIH Clinical Center, Dr. John Gallen, NIH Associate Director for Clinical Research, and the man of the hour, Dr. Harvey Alter, NIH Senior Scholar at the NIH Clinical Center. We will begin with brief opening remarks from Drs. Collins, Gilman, and Gallen, and then turn it over to Dr. Alter. After Dr. Alter's remarks, we will open it up for questions. Just a note, this call is about Dr. Alter and his Nobel Prize. If you have questions about other issues, please contact our news media branch. Also, we will have the audio file and video file of this telebriefing available later in the day. Please contact our staff and they'll send you the files. I'd now like to turn it over to Dr. Collins. Well, I will now take off my mask and uh, welcome all of you to this press telebriefing, uh, a source of great joy and pride uh, that we are able this morning uh, to celebrate the award of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine to three individuals, one of whom, Dr. Harvey Alter, has been very much involved in work at the Clinical Center for more than 50 years. Uh, doing remarkable work to keep the blood supply safe and particularly in his work identifying that there was another virus that we now call hepatitis C uh, that was potentially putting people at risks and in the work that he did identifying that that was an infectious agent, that it was a virus leading ultimately to the discovery of the agents and now the fact that we have treatments for this disease that are not just beneficial, they are curative. This is a very wonderful biomedical research story, and Dr. Alter is the perfect person to be recognized and to tell the story. He is a self-effacing scientist, a scientist. He is somebody who is persistent, dedicated, creative, determined, and cares deeply about saving lives. And his work at the NIH in our Department of Transfusion Medicine is really inspiring uh, to all who are going to hear about it today and who in a few minutes you'll hear about directly from him. So as the NIH director, I'm thrilled uh, that we can be here uh, to tell this story or have him tell this story and uh, take your questions after a couple of additional opening remarks. Let me now turn it over uh, to Dr. James Gilman, who is the CEO of the NIH Clinical Center, our largest research hospital in the world uh, where Dr. Alter has been doing his work for all these decades. Dr. Gilman. Francis, thank you. Uh, this is a great day for the NIH Clinical Center. It, it's a great day uh, for the science that uh, Dr. Alter has been involved there uh, with for over the last 50 years, but it's also a great day for somebody that everybody in the NIH Clinical Center uh, has uh, not only respect for, but also affection for. He is uh, one of the really good guys, known for uh, not only being an outstanding scientist, but also for a, uh, a sense of humor, his uh, approachability and accessibility. Uh, as someone who came to the NIH from the Department of Defense, uh, what uh, Dr. Alter has done uh, to make our blood supply safe for young men and women uh, deployed wherever they go in the world uh, for peacekeeping, humanitarian missions, or or even, uh, or, or even combat. It, it, it's what he's done to make that uh, blood supply safe is just remarkable. I couldn't be prouder of the NIH Clinical Center and Department of Transfusion Medicine, and I'm very grateful for having had the chance to get to know Dr. Alter. Thanks. Dr. Gallen. What a treat to celebrate Dr. Alter. Dr. Alter is the consummate clinical investigator. He has taken a project from basic science to the patient, and we are all here to celebrate Dr. Alter and his accomplishments. But in addition to being a clinical scientist, Dr. Alter is a wonderful physician, 
who cares passionately about his patients and has had that unusual opportunity to translate his scientific work to improve the public health by making our blood supply safer. So he's worked at what we call the House of Hope, the NIH Clinical Center, and I believe what he has done could not have been done easily anywhere else in the world. So Dr. Alter, this is a celebration to you, to the wonderful uh, Nobel Prize Committee for recognizing the importance of this work, and as well to the NIH and the NIH Clinical Center. Enjoy. Thanks, John Gallen, the Chief Scientific Officer of the Clinical Center. And now, the man of the hour, uh, Dr. Harvey Alter, uh, to say a few words about how this all happened, and then we'll take your questions. Dr. Alter. Thank you. Thank you for all these wonderful comments. Uh, I'm really humbled by, by this whole event. Uh, it started out at uh, 4.15 this morning <laughs> when my phone rang. Uh, got me out of a deep sleep, my wife as well, and we decided not to answer the phone. Uh, about five minutes later, it rang again, and we again made the decision not to answer the phone. Uh, when it rang for a third time, uh, I got out of bed rather angrily, uh, figuring this was another political solicitation or somebody wanted to extend the warranty on my car. Uh, but uh, it turned out to be a man from Stockholm, and that, that kind of left me dead in my tracks. And it's been a, a, quite a morning since that time. But I'll try to tell the story uh, as briefly as I can, but it is a long story, uh, uh, kind of a 50-year saga. Uh, and I think it's, it's a tribute to non-directed research. Uh, uh, you know, where you don't know where you're going, but you just keep moving. And uh, it started when I was just a fellow here at NIH spending uh, service time in the public health service. And by great fortune, my very first position was in the blood bank, but I worked with, I uh, got to work with Dr. Bloomberg, and we found a peculiar antigen in a Australian Aborigine, and it's a very kind of interesting story, but it led to the fact that this antigen that we found was the surface coating of the hepatitis B virus, and, uh, and proved to be uh, the basis for a test for, for blood donation. At that time, <clears throat> my plan was still to go into clinical practice, but I now had a great feel for what it was like to have something exciting happen in research. And later on, I got a chance to come back to NIH in 1970 to pick up studies that had actually begun by Paul Schmidt and Paul Holland in the blood bank and Barb Purcell in NIAID. Uh, and this was to follow patients prospectively after they received blood transfusions for open heart surgery. And what made it particularly valuable was that we were able to follow them every week or two post transfusion for six months. Uh, and we're able to store the samples. And because we had very, very limited testing at that time, all we could do is use a liver enzyme test to see whether people were getting elevations of this liver enzyme, which indicated hepatitis. But we had no test for viruses uh, uh, except for this Australia antigen for hepatitis B. In any event, when we started these studies, we found that 30% of people prior to 1970 who got open heart surgery at NIH developed uh, liver abnormalities in, indicative of hepatitis. Now, most of these cases were asymptomatic, and uh, well, the patients were already discharged from the hospital, and, and the fact that they got hepatitis might not have been reported back to NIH. But when we followed them prospectively, we could then pick up these cases, every one of them, and we were astounded to find that 30 percent were getting hepatitis. We then looked for causes, and the first thing we found was that if you got blood from 
a paid donor, a commercial blood donor, you had a 51% chance of getting hepatitis. If you got it from only volunteer donors, you had a 7% chance. So in 1970, we switched over. We went to an all-volunteer donor system, and we introduced the very first test for hepatitis B. This was not a licensed test at that time. We were just doing it in, in ourselves in the lab. Uh, but this caused a precipitous drop from 30% down to 10%. And over the ensuing years, uh, we just didn't know where we were going, but our goal then became to find out what was this causing all these cases. Uh, and in 1975, right here at NIH, Feinstone, Kapikian, and Purcell discovered the hepatitis uh, A virus. So we went back into these stored samples, and, and the value of stored samples is enormous because new assays keep coming up over the years, and if you can't go back, you have to start the whole study over again. This way we could dig into the reserves, and we found that some cases, about a quarter of them were hepatitis B related, none of them were hepatitis A related, so the majority of cases were there's some other entity that we called non-A, non-B, uh, thinking that within a short time we would figure it out and know what that agent was. But 15 years later, we still didn't know what the agent was. Uh, but we did know by using chimpanzees and using filtration and other methods, we knew that it was going to be a very small virus. There was probably going to be an RNA virus uh, or else a totally new class of viruses. So we knew that. But importantly, as we watched these patients, and then with the liver service at NIH, Dr. Hufnagel, uh, Dee Bichelli, and many others, now Dr. Ghani and Dr. Liang, uh, we started doing liver biopsies and found that although most patients with non a non b had pretty good histology and that the liver wasn't very damaged, but 10% already had cirrhosis. And another 13%, uh, I think, had uh, severe inflammation that might lead to fibrosis. Uh, as we re-biopsied people over the years, we found more people developing cirrhosis. In the end, about 20% of patients with non a non b wound up having cirrhosis, uh, and, and many of those dying. Uh, so this was not just a liver enzyme elevation. It proved to be a, a very significant disease affecting millions of people around the world, uh, leading to uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of deaths per year. Uh, and, but we were still stuck. We were still stuck through the 1980s uh, without having really identified the agent. And, and uh, it was then that molecular biology that Dr. Collins had been so involved in was beginning to emerge, uh, and we were just starting to use that to look for this non-A, non-B agent uh, when we were upstaged by uh, Michael Houghton and the Chiron Corporation, who cloned the non-A, non-B agent uh, along with Dan Bradley at the CDC. Uh, and as soon as they cloned it, they could uh, express the antigen associated with the virus, develop an antibody assay. They then came back to a panel of samples that we had, uh, a coded panel that had uh, fooled a lot of people who claimed to have a non-A, non-B assay. Uh, nobody else had broken this panel, uh, but the Chiron Corporation did. Uh, uh, so we then looked at our stored samples, and every one of our non-A, non-B cases had been negative for this, what was now called hepatitis C virus, before transfusion and became positive post-transfusion. Uh, this led to increasingly sensitive tests. And by 1997, the rates of hepatitis post-transfusion had gotten down to zero. 
Now, that's not an absolute zero, but so far we have not seen any more cases since 1997 in our, in our continuing studies. So that was that piece. And then uh, uh, Charlie Rice, who, another co-recipient, and others who uh, did a lot of work with the clone and, and ways to identify uh, drug effectiveness uh, and people at Gilead and Mike Sophia at Emory uh, developed a critical drug that interfered with one specific spot on the hepatitis C virus. And that one drug was a, was a game changer. Uh, and treatments which had been 50% uh, effective and then up to 70% effective suddenly became 80% uh, effective, then 90% effective, and now almost 100% effective. So currently, uh, we can cure virtually anybody who's identified, and the problem is to identify the people who are silent carriers of hepatitis C, to get drugs to be affordable enough to uh, treat everybody who is identified. And with that, it's possible to maybe even eradicate this disease over the next decades, uh, even in the absence of a vaccine. I don't know if that'll happen, but it, it could. Uh, a vaccine is still a goal, but it's been very difficult to do, just like for HIV. It's a highly mutable virus, and it's very difficult to develop an effective immune response uh, uh, for vaccine, but it was still helpful. So I think I'll end there and uh, answer any questions. Dr. Alter, thank you for that wonderful tour through 50 years of hard work uh, to get to the Nobel Prize this morning. John, do you want to uh, go forward with the logistics here about the Q&A? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Uh, Skyler, we'll begin our Q&A. If folks could identify themselves and their affiliation, that'd be great. If you would like to ask a question, press star one from your phone and leave your line and leave your name and your profit. Again, if you would like to ask a question, press star one. One moment. Skylar, it was a little hard to hear you when you made that announcement. You might make it again, a little closer maybe. If you would like to ask a question, press star 1 from your phone, unmute your line, and speak your name clearly when prompted. Again, if you would like to ask a question, press star 1. One moment as we wait for any questions. Our first question comes from Marilyn Mitchell. Uh, uh, Skyler, can't hear you again. Our first question comes from Marilyn Marchion from the Associated Press. Your line is now open. Thanks very much, and congratulations, Doctor, to you. Um, I wonder if um, you can speak a little bit about whether you're continuing research on this and um, what about prospects of a vaccine. And I believe is this is hepatitis C not the uh, the first um, viral infection entirely curable with medication. You could explain that. Uh, yeah. Well, um, thank you. I'm 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 sort of down on the downslope of my career, uh, but many people are still working on hepatitis C. Uh, right now, we're trying to finish up treating our cohort. We've already treated probably 90 percent of the people that are still in follow-up. Uh, everyone has been a cure. It's been uh, so dramatic. Uh, I think one of the, the greatest thrills for me has been having identified the first patient with non-A, non-B, and now see not only that he was cured, but that everybody else I have followed over the years is being cured. It's just I could never have imagined this, really, not, not in my lifetime. 
Um, so that so we're, we're trying to finish up with that cohort. We're still looking at transfusion recipients to make sure there's no other agent, uh, another, no other unknown agent that's causing problems. And so far, we have not identified any. Um, and doing a little of this and a little, little of that, we've done some uh, some work on COVID, but that's mostly been uh, a separate group, not my own work. Uh, and uh, the, we're not working ourselves on the vaccine. Dr. Houghton's group ha is working on a vaccine. He, he is using a, a surface uh, protein uh, as the immunogen uh, has had some success in chimpanzee model uh, showing that the vaccine seems to reduce the tendency to go on to chronic infection. It's not a, it's not a sterilizing vaccine. That is, it doesn't prevent infection, uh, but it may attenuate the infection. But this is still far from being uh, uh, in uh, clinical use, uh, and he's still working on it. Uh, one would think you could develop a vaccine because we know so much now about the virus. But one of the things that makes hepatitis C so difficult is that it is constantly mutating. So even if you make a good immune response against what is a predominant strain, uh, any one of many other simultaneously present strains could then take off. So you could kill the dominant strain, but another strain will come and, and keep the infection uh, going. Uh, and the same is true for HIV. It, these RNA viruses are very difficult to treat. HIV also directly suppresses the immune system, uh, which makes that even more difficult. Uh, hepatitis C also has some effects on where the large antigen load can uh, make the uh, immune system sort of tolerant. It overwhelms the T cell responses. So it's a tough fight, and I'm not sure we will get to a vaccine uh, with C uh, because it's expensive to do so and because you can cure people without a vaccine. So I, I don't know where that will progress. But if somebody comes up with a vaccine, it would probably be used. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Marilyn. Uh, next question, please, Skyler. Our next question comes from Sarah Kaplan, The Washington Post. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you so much, um, and congratulations, Dr. Alter. Um, I you know, reporting on your um, work this morning, I was struck by the difference between how the many decades it took to isolate and identify and understand the hepatitis C virus compared with the weeks that it took to identify and sequence the genome of SARS-CoV-2. Um, I'm curious, you know, now in this time when people are paying so much attention to virology and RNA viruses and things, are there lessons from your work on hepatitis C that you think apply to um, efforts to understand and, and fight this pandemic? I hope so. <laughs> uh, the, it is a big difference between the 1970s and 80s and now. The, the technology is so advanced uh, that things that, were, like the cloning of hepatitis C, which was so difficult, it took the Chiron Corporation six years to come up with a single clone out of millions that they tested. Uh, it, it was a laborious process. Uh, some of these things could now be done uh, in, a, in a college laboratory. Uh, but it's just that we, we've learned a lot. But, but I think the lesson for that I came up with and that I learned from Dr. Bloomberg is, is if you find something and you don't know what it is or you don't know why it is, keep looking, keep, keep at it, keep persisting. Uh, and with a persistent virus, uh, persisting research uh, paid off. 
But I have to emphasize that nowadays, to do that kind of long-term research that I was allowed to do at NIH, where I got support uh, from the heads of the clinical center, from uh, NIH in general, uh, for something where you didn't know where it was going. Uh, it, it, could have, it could have just ended uh, at any point, um, but things kept, kept breaking slowly. Uh, but I, I, as John said before, uh, I don't think this could have happened anywhere else uh, but NIH because um, in applying for grant, I'm not sure, you don't apply and say, I want to discover a new virus. <laughs> Uh, it, it just doesn't work that way. And uh, so you need time, you need to be allowed to have time, you need to have long-range long range planning, long-range thinking, and the freedom to pursue things that don't have an immediate effect. And nowadays, if you don't have an immediate endpoint, it's hard to get funding. Uh, so it's much more difficult, I think, for people now, especially young people, to pursue research. And I think the dynamic has to change a little bit. Uh, anyway, that, that's my lesson. But, but the technology is just astounding what can be done right now. All right. Thank you, Dr. Alter, and thanks, Sarah. Next question, please, Skyler. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, press star 1 from your phone, unmute your line, and speak your name clearly when prompted. Our next question comes from Ivan Tushikov, TAS New Agency. Your line is now open. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Alter, congratulations on your Nobel Prize. Uh, you mentioned that it might be possible to completely eradicate hepatitis C from humanity. W well, what, what kind of support do scientists need to speed up this process? Is, is it a question of uh, funding or having enough time or something else. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, that's a very good question. I, I think the the issues now are really not science anymore. The science in hepatitis C has gotten to the point where we don't really need better drugs than we already have. We don't need better tests than we already have. What we need is the the uh, political will to eradicate it. We need to make the drugs uh, affordable enough so that everybody who gets identified uh, can get the drug either through insurance or through low cost. Uh, and we need to be, you just ha have to have the will to do it. And it's got to be a global effort because we could maybe eradicate C in the U.S. Uh, but leave the, leave the developing world uh, to perpetuate the infection. Uh, the biggest risk factors right now are shared needle use. Uh, this, is a, this is a virus that is not transmitted any longer by blood, is not transmitted by blood transfusion, is not transmitted uh, or very low rate uh, sexually, is transmitted very low rate from mother to infant. So the, what's keeping it going now is shared needle use, uh, mostly by uh, the drug addict population. So we need to make efforts to that population to, uh, to uh, use, uh, if they're going to continue to inject, to use disposable equipment. Uh, we need to educate them. We need to give uh, alternative ways to uh, get rid of addiction. In the third world, we need to teach uh, uh, doctors, healthcare workers, uh, not to use needles or vials over again, uh, not to use the same vial for different patients. That requires resources. That requires money, because in these countries, you cannot always afford to just throw away a needle the way we do. Uh, so those are the kind of things that need to be done. Uh, and, but mainly it's to test and treat. Uh, test, identify, and then treat all those who are found to be positive. Uh, if we had a great, 
rapid test for COVID and a great treatment for COVID, it would be the same, the same principle. But with hepatitis C, we already have those things, and uh, it, it's, that's the approach. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Alter. Skylar, next question, please. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, press star one from your phone, unmute your line, and speak your name clearly when prompted. Again, if you would like to ask a question, press star one. One moment as we wait for any remaining. Okay, well, Skylar, it doesn't sound like you have up more questions in the queue. There are no further questions in the queue. Okay, well, thank you very much. So this concludes our telebriefing. Again, an audio file and a video file will be available later this afternoon. Please contact our office for those files. Thanks again for joining us, and congratulations again to Dr. Alter and his colleagues. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you for your participation in today's conference. You may disconnect at this time.